So, the big question is this. How are entrepreneurs and real estate investors like us, ones who want to grow our businesses and who are tired of paying for really expensive alternative lending? How do we tap into the most inexpensive money available and do it without the hassle of typical borrowing? That is the question, and this podcast will give you the answers. I'm Merrill Chandler, and welcome to the RUFable Podcast. Welcome back, everybody. This is Merrill Chandler, your host of RUFable. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about how lenders, FICO, the whole entire funding game players, how they use credit scores to distract rookies, rookie borrowers, from what is really being measured. So when we come back, we'll get right to it. And we are back. All right. So credit scores. We've talked about them. I've told you they're the third or fourth most important funding criteria. They're in charge of just determining what your interest rates are and your and your limits will be, but they are not in charge of your pr- approvals, guys. So let's find out what else lenders do with these scores in order to distract rookies because remember, m- my job is to make you a professional borrower. This is what rookies do, and we're going to talk about that right now. But first thing I want to, you to, uh, to be reminded of is this is one of the biggest, hugest landmines ever. Here's the thing. Can you have a great score and still be unfundable? The answer invariably, of course, is yes. So we're going to be talking about why scores can be high and you be unfundable, why you can have derogatory accounts and not be fundable. So what if scores are not the true indicator of fundability, what are? What 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 should we really be looking at? And more importantly, what do lenders actually look at to determine your fundability? So first things first, your credit score is not a fundability indicator. It's an indicator of rate and and um, uh, a rate and term and the uh, amount of the limit. It is not whether or not you're going to get approved. It has it has less or little impact than any of the other indicators. What does impact your fundability? What a true indicator of fundability is is the quality of your borrower profile. All right. So the borrower profile is everything. Credit profile equals fundability. So let's take a look at this Uh, case. uh, Robert's uh, uh, our our first case study is Robert's personal credit. So many of us would kill to have Robert's credit scores, right? 844, 843, 850. I mean, two of them are with one point of each other. The max distance. Remember how we talked about the the spread, right? If it's over, uh, if it's over 20 points, it gets kicked out into manual underwriting. But if it's under uh, five to 10 points, you're, you're peachy in, in staying in, at least staying in manual or uh, automatic underwriting. Here, we got no more than seven point spread. So we're thinking, we'll kill for these. We would love to have these credit scores, except when Robert came to us, it was an unfundable credit profile. Remember in the last episode, we talked about you can have you, uh, you can file an application, you can get your inquiry submitted. You can uh, but the bottom line is will a lender lend to you off of all of the criteria? In this case, it, this is an unfundable profile. What we mean by unfundable profile is getting the types of credit uh, instruments that you're after. Now, this uh, uh Robert's profile was a Lowe's account, a Best Buy account, a Home Depot account, and a local credit union um, uh, credit card. I believe is it was five thousand dollars. But forgive me if I'm if I'm off on that. But I believe it was five thousand dollars. Now, the interesting thing is is that there's what's co- called peer lending right? Peer lending dictates that you're going to get a yes from like kind lenders. You're going to get a big, big yes. So because there's so many tier four cards, which we'll be, we'll be covering in a moment that don't get anxious. These are tier four uh, credit instruments because they're tier four. This is a tier three, but it's a, it's a, it's a 80% um, value contribution. Again, we'll be covering that uh, shortly in one of the next episodes because this is a, this is a consumer profile. 
This is a profile, an unsophisticated borrower, what I call, and it's not pejorative, it's just a rookie, somebody who is just barely getting into the game or doesn't understand the rules of the game. So it's a rookie, right? It's an amateur borrower's profile. And that amateur borrower's profile means that wherever you go, you're going to be approved. If you've got those scores, 850, 844, 843, that means you're going to get, if you go to Amazon, Express, Victoria's Secret, The Limited, you're going to get the very best interest rates on those types of cards because you've proven your 800 plus credit score tells tells future lenders that for these types of accounts, this quality of a profile, rookie, consumer, um, uh, uh, amateur, this level, this quality of a profile will merit the very best interest rates, the very best limits, the very best everything of like kind lenders. These are known as finance company cards, uh, consumer finance accounts, as uh, as myfico.com credit reports indicate. And they actually have a negative effect on your profile. There, there are what, what are called negative indicators that point out that, uh, that these accounts are on your profile and they diminish your fundability, right? Because they're looking for professional borrowers. Lenders want to lend to professional borrowers, except merchants. Merchants want anybody. Just buy my, just buy my, buy my merchandise, right? So this is what this is what an 800 plus credit score means. It means you will qualify for the similar exact types of quality of accounts. If you've got lots of tier fours, you're going to, and you have an 800 plus credit score, you're going to qualify for more tier fours. But what is not going to happen ever, 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 ever is Wells Fargo is not going to give you a $50,000 business line of credit on your Home Depot reputation. Guys, it is not going to happen. Hasn't ever, won't ever. You're not going to get these types of trade lines, these types of accounts on, uh, on the business side. You might get a personal one, but again, then that changes the personal profile. But this is uh, Robert's personal profile. You're not going to get business lines of credit, commercial loans, et cetera, based on that reputation. You follow me? All right, let's go to our second case study, Chris. Now, Chris came to us, uh, good scores. I mean, some of us would kill for those scores. But the issue is, is that 780 to 795, there's 15 points. So we're still under the margin of error for automatic, uh, for manual underwriting. It stays in automatic underwriting. Chris came to us because he was pissed off because what when he went for a business line of credit in automatic underwriting, they said it was uh, that he was awarded a $50,000 business line of credit. He was thrilled out of his mind, except it was a conditional approval. Now, c conditional approval is the is uh, banker speak for, oh, we got to put this into manual underwriting. You just got kicked out of automatic underwriting. But when they were in manual underwriting, they took forty thousand dollars away and approved him for ten thousand dollar business line of credit. Why? Why? Well. Because automatic underwriting is doing calculations and math like we did in the previous episode. It, remember, I, I said there's only three or four of the metrics in that example. There are other metrics that are being uh, uh, modeled, and I want to show you what uh, a couple of those are right now. Take a look at his. Uh, take a look at his profile. When they pulled the credit and gave him a, a conditional approval, they noticed that the Chase account that was on his credit profile was a 20 year old account. And he was only 30 years old, I believe. Again, the details, forgive me if I'm just off a little bit. 30, but it was a vast difference. The account, the Chase account was a was 20 years old and Chris, and Chris was only 30. 30 years old, which means he would have had to have gotten this account when he was 10 years old. Okay. Come to find out that in the, uh, the, in manual underwriting, they discovered that the chase account, 
he was an authorized user on his father's. So notice the data points didn't sync up. And as a result, he got kicked out into manual underwriting. This is a perfect example. Just like 36 months on the previous uh, podcast we did, um, the 36% over the 20 uh, average utilization over the 24 month look back period, they're measuring that stuff. They're looking at how old are the accounts versus the age of the individual, right? They cannot they cannot deny you because of age, but they can deny you for lack of experience. So, or the wrong types of profiles. So Chase, he was an authorized user on his father account. That Chase account was a $50,000 account, which proves once one more time proves my account that if he was the owner, if Chris were the owner of the Chase account all by himself, then he would have qualified for that $50,000 business line of credit because he had proved over 20 years and we, we don't have to go that long for to the proof, right? Three months, six months, 12 months, 24 months is sufficient, but he had proven over 24 months uh, or uh, uh, 20 years with Chase that he had never been late and treated that uh, Chase's money with deference and respect. So he would, he was originally approved but they found out that that wasn't his case. So let me tell you what the deal is with authorized users. The, out of the mouth of the FICO score development team on the personal side, they we asked specifically in one of our 100 questions, what is how, how are authorized users scored? And we were told specifically and directly that if you're an authorized user, the max you get, and it is altered in the different versions of the software, but I'm generalizing, you have they get up to but not more than 40 percent of the possible points in a uh, in, in as an authorized user let's say there's 100 possible points for a chase card they only get 40 percent of them okay so if someone's using it to raise their score it's a it, it's it, it's no bueno because you're only getting 40 percent of the possible points but what they also said was that because that authorized user has full access to the account they don't know in the calculations, they don't know who made the charges to the account. And so the authorized user, if that account goes negative, it's going to destroy, just like it's going to destroy and drop the, the owner of the account's um, credit score and fundability. It's also going to devastate the authorized users. So you get 40% of the positive, but you get 100% of the negative for being the authorized user. All right. Now, I want to I want to tell us another story about authorized users because the and and forgive me if I share these a couple times, but some of them are just devastating um, circumstances. So we had one client come in. He had been optimizing his personal side while he was prepping his for his business funding, and he had done he had worked so hard to get his his profile into a position where he got approved for a Chase card. Different person than Chris, but got approved for a chase card and he was so excited and there were uh, and it, it was one of those uh a chase sapphire or something where they uh give you uh, fifty thousand points if you spend three thousand dollars in 90 days well against what he sh our recommendations he went up and charged like ten thousand uh, dollars nine thousand dollars of a ten thousand um, dollar it was huge it was 90 percent utilization within the first 30 days okay error number one he also at the same time put one of his friends who had horrible credit he put that friend on as an authorized user to help that friend's credit and chase shut the entire line down two mistakes number one they Put, he put an authorized user on his account that had horrible credit and they did not and since that authorized user technically has access to the full line and they're irresponsible they had shown irresponsible uh, borrower behavior in the past huge mark against uh, against the uh, owner of the account and then the owner went up and charged like 90 percent on that card worst things you can do in the first 30 days so two marks against him chase shut it down and he has not recovered from Chase at all. He's still making payments on the Chase account, but his optimization plan had to go in a completely different direction because he burned a tier one bank by 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 not playing by the rules of the game. So I bring that up in this circumstance because I want to show you that 
being an authorized user or providing somebody as an authorized user does not help them if you're giving them authorized user status and it may harm you. Now, if you've got the card for years and you've got a, a perfect payment history, there's less negative impact because you've made a statement and you've proven yourself, excuse me, you've proven yourself to that lender. But authorized users are, do not significantly improve. Now, here's the other thing, because we're talking in this section about the scores are used to distract um, borrowers from what's really being rookie borrowers from what's really being measured. Here's a perfect example. People out there, you'll find internet and uh, keep looking because some of our, uh, we've done Facebook lives um, where we are, where, where we're taking on individuals who are selling trade lines, okay? They're selling access to authorized users. They say your score can go up. And the thing is, your score can go up, but the 99th percentile, it is not going to help your fundability. There are a couple of places when somebody's recovering from a bankruptcy or some devastating financial uh, injury, as we've been using the, the basketball metaphor, if they're on the bench because of a, a financial injury, then there are, uh, it's high negative impact. But you guys, you cannot, an authorized user helps your score a little bit, but it doesn't help your fundability at all because no one in this case, as, as I'm going to show you, no one is going to approve an authorized user for $50,000 business lines of credit. <clears throat> they failed. It failed. It was up in here. Whoa, I'm going backward. They, they failed. Here, they took $40,000 away because that $50,000 automatic underwriting with conditional approval went into manual underwriting. That authorized user is not fundable. Authorized users are not fundable. And so he did not get that Wells Fargo uh, account opened. He, well, he got a 10,000 because he'd had other funding criteria. And like we'd said in the, in the last uh, episode, um, manual under uh, or even manual underwriting, they'll approve you, but you got, you now have to prove up, but he didn't get as much as what he would, would have received in, in automatic underwriting, manual underwriting, you get less money and, 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 and worse rates. So you've got to, you have got to uh, be aware of what they're grading. And so we're not grading up point uh, uh um credit score points we don't care about the credit score points we don't care that his scores are good or great we don't care because it didn't do him any good when it came those scores did not do him any good because he didn't have the right kind of profile so so the chase didn't make sense bank of america was a co-branded card with the new york yankees and he had a yonkers um uh a yonkers um uh, department store card. So he's same as the as Robert in case study number one. He's not going to get the funding that that is possible when you have a high value personal borrower profile. Remember those words: high value personal profile, <coughs> high value borrower profile, high value credit profile. They're all similar in nature, describing the same thing. So approvals as we said business approvals 80 percent of all business approvals for small businesses and entrepreneurs are based on a fundable borrower profile and a fundable profile trumps any score i will take a a i will take a 720 credit score from a fundable profile over an 820 unfundable profile do you see how this is working we don't care about the score until we're fundable. Then, we, and all scores follow fundability. So you can have an 800 plus fundable profile. And that's why you hear me talking that language over and over and over. Next, that we got to understand is your personal profile is the goose that lays the golden eggs. Your personal profile, switching metaphors, is the funding machine for your business. We just had a uh, comment. Uh, one of our um, one of our uh, superhero clients was a student, became a client, and he just sent a uh, 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 on our on our um, 
inside uh, in our insider secrets he gave a, a testimonial that uh, that I that I want to read um, so I want to get that um, my producer is gonna get that for me um, so sky can uh, to, to show me that uh, but I want you to understand and he even he even says this in just magic freaking language so the uh, let me give you an example of what some of these golden eggs are right Business credit cards, FICO-driven hard money loans, unsecured business loans, commercial loans, trophy business credit lines, trust and prestige in uh, uh, trust and prestige in in partnerships. These are the 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 eggs that the golden goose, your personal profile, will lay. So, um, uh, uh, so do you have that copy? for me um i can't pull it up on here turn your turn your screen so i'm going to read this to you because it is worth every it's worth every single word and sentence it was it was pure magic so uh, this is on our insider secrets our client group uh, is gentleman's name is kirk wetschreck and he said i started my journey with credit sense last fall at the very first live boot camp in minneapolis minnesota and became a client credit eagle in training on april 2019 this team is amazing and has continued to coach me and teach me the rules of the game to help me optimize both my personal and business profiles. I've had several wins along the way already with profile optimization, score improvements, automatic credit uh, limit increases on my personal cards, and had my first Eagle flight with my first Chase business credit card on my QFE, my qualified funding entity. More on this later. With an initial limit of thirty-three thousand dollars, and uh, and I'm on my way to a million in funding in the next twelve to twenty-four months. Thank you, Merrill and team, for showing me the path from being a credit average to credit savage. And I'm going and I'm getting the ball rolling. So much amazing content and so much to learn. Hashtag funding hacker. Hashtag credit sense. Hashtag credit eagle. Hashtag credit savage. Uh, hashtag I am effable. Hashtag respect the golden goose. <laughs> Guys, I share that with you because hashtag respect the golden goose. So uh, thank you for allowing me. I'm, I'm super proud. Kirk is amazing. And we have had so many um, uh, 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 wonderful conversations in his optimization path towards fundability. And and he's already got results coming in 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 just as of the production of this we're only five months into his process and he's already taking down um business credit instruments that are legit business instruments that promotes everything that we're talking about i share that with you because your personal profile is the golden goose so hashtag respect the golden goose all right those are what we're after. We want the best mortgages, the best loans, the best credit lines, the best of everything. So let's talk about for a second, what makes up a borrower profile, right? What makes up that borrower profile and how do we, how does it measured, et cetera. Now, a fundable borrower profile has an optimized personal credit identity whole section on this. We already talked about this earlier, right? We went through the optimized personal credit identity. So you guys should already be pros at, at, at that. If not, go to fundinghackers.com, go to the boot, uh, check into the bootcamp and get, get, get your, get your profile sorted out, right? We, second, we want to optimize our revolving accounts portfolio. That's coming up in a few, uh, in a few podcasts, gonna knock it out of the park. I'm gonna show you exactly what is valuable, what's not valuable, what, what is junk. We just had some, uh, I just showed you some slides of junk uh, junk um, profiles and junk uh, credit instruments that are actually downgrading your fundability. And FICO admits they're downgrading. They actually put a negative indicator saying, too many consumer uh, 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 finance accounts, right? Number three, optimized installment accounts portfolio. Now remember, we use the term portfolio to describe the collection of your revolving accounts, credit cards, cre uh, charge cards, et cetera. Your installment loans are, th that portfolio is your collection of your auto loans, your mortgages, your, your student loans, uh, 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 personal loans, et cetera, ATVs and grand piano loans. Not, not revolving, 
installment accounts. We'll define all those. We have a wonderful section coming up uh, to describe that. Accurate and consistent trade line perform per, uh, uh, reporting. You have to have consistency between all three bureaus. That myfico.com. Get that report, get that monitoring, because that is where you're going to see the truth, not just of your 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 unweighted credit scores, but the actual scores lenders are using. We got to know this, guys. And then um, uh, income. So income is a function. There's household income. There's individual income. There is traffic from your um, from your business. There's there are amazing ways to to hit funding guidelines with your income, right? And uh, we work with people who are on fixed income. We have worked with people who have 10 uh, uh, or eight, uh, um, eight, what do they call it? Eight um, uh, digits. What, what do you call it when you have $10 million a year in revenues? I'm sorry. Eight figure, eight figure incomes. Okay. We got everybody in between. So income, it takes longer, but you are not out of the gate if you have small or fixed income. And then there's the qualified funding entity. This is what Kurt was talking about, the QFE. The qualified funding entity is an entity that lenders look at and said that I will lend to that entity. And I've got some amazing stuff that we will be covering over time on that. That's uh, numerous down the road, but qualified funding entity, uh, there are things that are completely unfundable out of the gate, even in the name. And I'll, I will tease with that you with it now, but your name, if it has one of the red flag words, are gonna get are gonna get crushed. You want to know more? Again, go to the fundinghackers.com and root around, read the blogs, and uh, the, go to the boot camp. Get the fast forward on all this stuff, even what you're binging. So um, the next thing is, after you have a quality profile, once you've put together all of these things and you have what's going on, uh, a, a fundable profile, then what do you do? What What's after that? And I said it again, I'm gonna say it a hundred times after this, guys. 24 month look back period, period. That 24 month look back period, let's take a look at it. It's time to do a deeper dive there. So 24 month look back period, it, it consists of, now there's a bunch of, things in addition to this, but we're, we're covering the, the, the big ones, right? The age of a loan or a, a credit card or a account, what is the limit or the original loan amount, right? The higher, the better, but uh, we, we're all about strategic debt. I, I'm not trying to get you in debt. The, all of these have to make sense, but you can, you, you, time and money are interchangeable. And so the more money you have, the less time fundability takes. The less money you have, the more time it takes. And it's okay. Everybody takes time, but you I, you need to know what they're measuring on the 24 month look back period. So what is the age in this 24 month? And it's a rolling 24 month. What is the balance? What is utilization? We already saw last episode how that comes into play and they actually calculate your, uh, they look back uh, uh, at your 24, mo most recent 24 months for the average balance and then they project, or yeah, average utilization and they project that on to your usage to see if you even qualify for that new credit instrument, right? Then there's payment status and that payment status is not just paid as agreed, but how many months have you been paying exactly on the due date? Not the day before, you don't get as many points, not the day after you don't get as many points, most of us think, hey, I'm paying it early. I'm getting uh, I, I'm getting more points. But as we're going to dis discuss in a episode, in a couple, like two or three episodes, we're going to be talking about one of the most devastating secrets that lenders hold back from us, that we're going to pull back the curtain and we're going to find out exactly what lenders are doing so that you can have a spectacular payment status and improve your fundability incredibly right and then payment consistency um we're, we're uh, or the, the the reverse of that making sure we'll, we'll be talking um soon that you never make the minimum payment you always you always want to keep the algorithm guessing what message does it send when you make the same payment every single month it says i can't afford anything else so the insider secret is what is it measuring 
it's measuring exactly how much of the payment. You don't have to make a big payment, but just don't make the minimum payment. Make more than that and never make the same payment twice. Same payment amount twice. But again, payment status and payment consistency go together. More on this when we hit the revolving accounts uh, episode. Telling you guys, this is crazy stuff. You got to know this game or you're going you're going to continue to lose. You're just going to continue to get dunked on. So let's look at the 24 month uh, look back period. First of all, we have FICO 40 again. FICO doesn't call it that. We do the FICO 40 behaviors. That's what they're met. FICO 40 behaviors. All right. Then there is over time. And here's what we have. Uh, uh, and so I've just got on, on the screen. I've got 24 months. All right. By the way, all you Jasons in the world, I want you to know that you are, have been memorialized inside of the calendar. The June, August, September, October, November. I discovered this when I put this when I put this together. The name Jason is memorialized from from uh, July through uh, November. So all Jasons, congratulations! Just thought, but notice. I don't know what it means, but this is these are the patterns that I find. This is why I'm 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 good at what I do. This is what I see. I connect dots, even as random as it is. I don't know if you knew that there was a Jason in the in the name of uh, the calendar, but now you do. So that's what we're looking for. Patterns, connecting dots and making all this make sense. All right. So the next thing that we're looking at is the the first the first increment that is measured by the 24 month look back period is three months. So we're going to call three months X. Then there is six months and we're going to call that two X. Then there is four months, which is, um, or it's 12 months, which we call four X. And then we're going to say that there's 24 months, which is 16 X. So if you see the pattern guys, each period is the square of the previous period. So that's why it's logarithmic. Logarithmic is a slow start and a steep uh, uh, incline. So it is the square of the next period. Now, what's fascinating about this is that each of these values being the square means that it, the longer you do a behavior for good or bad, the longer you do the, the behavior, the, the better or worse it's going to be. So what I want to show you what I want to show you is that this now the the language says each period doubles the previous value and that is an error. Each period each period is the square of the previous uh, value. And so what we need to understand that 24 month look back period is if you do something if you have a high if you have a high utilization for 3 months and then pay it off there's only x amount of damage against your 24 month look back period. But if you do it for if you carry that same high balance for 6 months then you have twice the the damage. 12 months is four times the damage and 16 times the damage if you've been going for 24 months with uh, with that same high utilization. If you've been paying your credit card off for uh, for three, six, 12, or 24 months at to zero uh, on the due date, then you're getting the you're getting the juice from FICO for having done it for the entire 24 month look back period. But if you only go three months of paying on time and, or paying it to zero, and then you go back to high utilization, then the three months starts over and you start that three months trails off and it's replaced and gone after three months. Follow me. This is, this is vital for us to be able to, to, to be able to understand. So we have been led to believe that scores matter. Our wrap up for this episode is simply saying that scores determine are, are useful in determining rates and terms and amounts of approvals. They are not the they are not the important factor in the approvals. The whether or not you get approved is based on something completely different. So our goal is twofold. One, get approved 
and then be approved for the highest possible limits or loan amounts and the lowest possible interest rates, correct? We got to focus on what is being measured. And I and this whole episode goes through that. So um, if you haven't done so, go to fundinghackers.com, to, um, check it out. Uh, this blog, uh, this podcast will be in written form. Study the graphics. Rewatch this in uh, in the video version if you're listening to it. Guys, do not miss out on what they're measuring. SCORE is not in charge of approvals. All the things we've covered in this episode are. My name is Merrill Chandler. I am the founder and CEO of Funding Hackers, and, and we are here to serve you to make sure that you stop stepping on those funding landmines that we don't even know exist. Godspeed, God bless, and we will see you next time. Hey guys, thank you for listening to Are You Effable? Please leave comments because I would love to read about your aha moments from this episode. And be sure to visit fundinghackers.com to view the blog post, get important links, join our community, and much, much more. And you gotta tell your friends about this podcast. We want them to become effable too.